Hi, this is Maester Mary, and I am happy to welcome you to my Game of Thrones Season 8 prediction video. In the shadow of the Iron Bank, who really controls the Golden Company? So, how can the show include the Golden Company, an army full of people that we have never met before, in a way that is compelling and meaningful? It has to connect them to characters, plot lines, and themes that we care about. And I'm going to make a prediction for how the show can do this in a way that makes narrative sense and good television. I predict that the Golden Company will dramatically betray Cersei in a plot orchestrated by the Iron Bank of Bravos, with an assist from Varys the Spider. I read this result in the flames because the show foreshadowed, one, that the Iron Bank is an endgame player and two, that the Iron Bank and Golden Company will betray Cersei. Plus, three, this ties together multiple important but unresolved storylines from the books that the show has compressed. I'm looking at y'all, Fagon and John Connington. And four, George R. R. Martin drops some badass reveals about the Iron Bank's power in fire and blood. So, Let's get started with a quick trip back to season four, where the show begins setting up the Iron Bank as a key player in the Game of Thrones. The Crown owes the Iron Bank of Brothers a tremendous amount of money. How much? A tremendous amount. There must be someone at the Iron Bank you can speak to, come to some arrangement. The Iron Bank is the Iron Bank. There is no someone. Someone does work there. It is comprised of people. And a temple is comprised of stones. One stone crumbles and another takes its place. And the temple holds its form for a thousand years or more. And that's what the Iron Bank is, a temple. We all live in its shadow and almost none of us know it. You can't run from them, you can't cheat them, you can't sway them with excuses. If you owe them money and you don't want to crumble yourself, you pay it back. This exchange is a vivid illustration of the Iron Bank's influence, and it shows that D&D are clued into the importance of the bank to the overall story. D&D actually mentioned in the commentary to the episode that they loved the Iron Bank because it's such an atypical element of a fantasy story, since it's so realistic. You know, banks are more realistic than ice zombies. They also emphasize that the Iron Bank plays an important role, but it's almost always behind the scenes. And then they also mention that the institution is heartless. In the same episode in season four, we saw Stannis plead with the Iron Bank so that he could buy a contract with the Storm Crows, another sellsword company. The ways that Davos convinces the Iron Bank is really interesting in the context of more recent events. He argues the real reason they supported Tommen and Joffrey was Tywin Lannister's reputation, and that Tywin is old, will be dead soon, and Cersei is, to put it mildly, unreliable. This mirrors the Feast for Crows plotline involving the Iron Bank, there, the bank also backed Stannis while simultaneously calling in the throne's debts against the Lannisters throughout the kingdom. So, this is not a thread that D&D invented out of whole cloth. As I'll talk about more at the end of the video, it is one that's also woven throughout the books, albeit in slightly different ways. For example, in A Dance with Dragons, Jon Snow negotiates with the Iron Bank, for money for ships to rescue the wildlings at Hardhome, and for food to feed the Watch. But the biggest hint that the Iron Bank will be important to the end game of the show is that they are all over the place in the plot of Season 7. Remember that immediately after Cersei's coronation, Tycho Nestoris shows up to call in the Crown's debt, and then Cersei's decision to attack Highgarden is motivated by the fact that she needs to get the Tyrell gold so she can repay the Iron Bank. And then even after the debt is repaid, Cersei makes a point to take out a new loan for the Golden Company. This is a huge part of Cersei's plot in the last season. And this brings me to my next point. 
that the show has foreshadowed Cersei's portrayal by the Iron Bank and the Golden Company. Season 7 directly sets up this turn of events. The Iron Bank knows that the Golden Company is crucial to Cersei maintaining her crown, because she told them her plans. Here is what Cersei told Tycho in Season 7, Episode 4, right before the Field of Fire 2.0. My only venture at this moment is re-establishing control over this continent and every person on it. I see a great deal of potential in that venture. I imagine it would require outside investment. It will indeed. I need to expand my armies, my navies. My hand, Kyburn, has made overtures to the Golden Company in Essos. I know them well. They have helped us recover significant sums from parties who had fallen into deep arrears. While Tycho seems enthusiastic here, his motives are of course simply pursuing the Iron Bank's interests. And he's no idiot. Before Cersei repaid the Iron Bank with the Tyrell's gold, Tycho expressed plenty of healthy skepticism about Cersei's plans. And in particular, he questioned the loyalty of her allies. My armada owns the Narrow Sea. Euron Greyjoy's armada owns the Narrow Sea. Euron Greyjoy is loyal to me. For now. The Iron Bank is effectively warning Cersei, be careful who you trust. Taken together, these scenes provide the foundation for a major betrayal. So now, to predict what the treachery will look like, we should recall Littlefinger's iconic double-crossing of Ned. Recently, Maisie Williams commented that fans should rewatch the show's first season, because there will be many parallels to season one in the final season. And Peter's betrayal of Ned in favor of Cersei is one of the most iconic moments in all of the show. Remember, Ned confides in Peter that he needs the loyalty of the gold cloaks. And so he asks Littlefinger as master of coin, basically the banker for the Iron Throne, to buy their loyalty for him. Peter, of course, sets himself up as in control of who the gold cloaks will back. Whose peace do the gold cloaks protect? Who do they follow? The man who pays them. And of course, Peter backs Cersei instead. You can see where I'm going with this. Tycho Nestoris and the Iron Bank flipping the Golden Company on Cersei would be parallel to Littlefinger as the master of coin flipping the gold cloaks against Ned. Cersei told Tycho that she needed the Golden Company, and in essence, she's relying on the Iron Bank's money to buy their loyalty for her. And just like Peter's purse strings control who sits on the Iron Throne at the end of Season 1, the show has set up the Iron Bank to control, or at least try to control, who sits on the Iron Throne at the end of the final season. Even the names, the Golden Company and the Gold Cloaks, reinforce that these are soldiers loyal only to the highest bidder. Look, Cersei being undone by essentially the same trick she used against Ned? That is the kind of echo that both George R. R. Martin and the showrunners love. Speaking of poetry, this outcome rhymes with the Lannister's de facto words. A Lannister always pays his debts. Yup, it is poetic as hell for the Lannisters to fall because their debtor stabbed them in the back. Remember, the Iron Bank will have its due. The Lannisters' power was derived from their gold, and in the show, we learned their gold dried up years ago because Tywin spent the last of their fortune paying for a bunch of wars. Now Karma has returned to kick his family in the butt and beat the Lannisters at their own game. The Iron Bank using the Golden Company to turn against Cersei ties together multiple unresolved, compressed storylines from the books. First, the Golden Company breaking contract with Cersei fits the Golden Company's plot in the books. To dramatically oversimplify, 
In the books, the Golden Company are under a secret long-term contract to support young Griff. As a result, they end up breaking another different contract to sell to Westeros to support Griff's claim to the Iron Throne. Obviously, though, the show deleted young Griff and has likely repurposed various elements of his plotline and incorporated them across multiple characters. But what's important about young Griff slash Aegon Targaryen slash Fagon Targaryen slash Fagon Blackfire is that he is either an actual Targaryen or posing as one. And that his claim is bankrolled and supported by none other than Illyrio Mopetus and the showrunner's favorite eunuch, Vars, as part of a long-term secret plotting to cement their control of Westeros through some kind of Targaryen or Blackfire restoration. So on one hand, this suggests that in the show, the Golden Company may have secret Targaryen loyalties and end up supporting Danny or Jon. But on the other hand, a long-term conspiracy involving the Golden Company could also satisfactorily tie back in to Vary's plotline. This is intriguing because the show has kept Varys around as part of Danny's entourage, even though he hasn't had much to do the past couple seasons. As part of the show's efforts to write young Griff out of the plot, the show transformed Varys' support for one alleged Targaryen into another and rewrote Varys' plotting so that it was in favor of Danny the whole time instead of young Griff. So now, let's think back to how the show probably set up Vars plotting in favor of Danny from the very beginning of the all-important first season. Vars' buddy, Illyrio Mopatis, is the one who gifted Danny her very special dragon eggs. So, if Vars, and perhaps Illyrio, are involved in calling some secret obligation of the Golden Company in, I wouldn't be surprised. Given that Vars' primary methods are behind-the-scenes, long-term, back-channel plotting, the Iron Bank would be a perfect partner in crime for Vares, even in the show. Plus, as we're about to see, the Iron Bank is familiar with dragon eggs. Fire and Blood confirms that George R. R. Martin wrote the Iron Bank as a political player with an interest in dragons. Archmaester Gildane tells us that Alyssa Farman stole three dragon eggs from Queen Alisane. Eggs in tow, she traveled to Pentos and eventually Bravos, where she sold the eggs to the city's leader, the Sea Lord. Fascinating, right? As other commentators have realized, George R. R. Martin really winks at the astute reader when he drops in King Jaehaerys' reaction to the, half, to the theft. Jaehaerys, skeptical that a non-Targaryen could hatch the eggs, says, Some spicemonger in Pentos will find himself possessed of three very costly stones. Illyrio is, of course, a Pentashi spicemonger, so we can safely say that this is at least a hint that these are the three eggs Illyrio gave Danny, even if George R. R. Martin insists that Fire and Blood doesn't conclusively reveal how Illyrio got the eggs. But the really interesting part, if you're me at least, is that Illyrio probably acquired the eggs from the Iron Bank, who were using the eggs to secure the Iron Throne's debt to Bravos. Here is the passage with the evidence. When the Sea Lord inquired as to what the matter at hand might be, the Septon gave him a sad smile and said, Is that how this must be played? We are speaking of three eggs. Need I say more? I admit to nothing. If I was in possession of such eggs, however, it was only because I purchased them. From a thief. How shall that be proved? 
Bravos is a city of laws. Who is the rightful owner of these eggs? Can they show me proof of ownership? His grace can show you proof of dragons. That made the Sea Lord smile. The veiled threat. There are certain things that we might do to your king as well, however. Shall I enumerate? There is in this city a certain guild, let us say, whose members are very skilled at their chosen profession. They could not destroy King's Landing nor fill its streets with corpses, but they could kill a few. A well-chosen few. Threats make me uncomfortable. Westerosi may be warriors, but we Ravosi are traders. Let us trade. What do you offer? I do not have these eggs, of course. You cannot prove elsewise. If I did have them, however, well. Until they hatch, they are but stones. Would your king begrudge me three pretty stones? So, instead of stones, let me offer gold. And with that, the real bargaining began. At the Sea Lord's urging, the Iron Bank of Bravos forgave the entire remaining principal of its loan to the Iron Throne, and all at the cost of three stones, Barth told the king. Y'all, there are so many awesome things about this meeting, including, one, it hints that the Iron Bank acquired the eggs Alyssa stole from Alisane and kept them to secure the Iron Throne's debt to the bank. So, second, the Iron Bank likely gave the eggs to Illyrio, perhaps intending he return them to a Targaryen. Plus, three, the Iron Bank used the skills of the faceless men to threaten the Targaryen reign in Westeros, which reinforces the theory that the faceless men and the Iron Bank work together to project political power. And finally, four, on the page right after this passage, we learn that Jaehaerys used the debt reduction triggered by the three dragon eggs to build infrastructure in King's Landing, including water fountains, streets, and a sewage system. The Iron Bank's loans to the Iron Throne which eventually ended up being secured by the three dragon eggs later given to Danny, literally built King's Landing. All right, I'm going to try to keep this prediction video short and sweet, but I can't help myself sometimes. And I want to go over two examples from the books of Bravos combining the assassination powers of the faceless men and the financial powers of the Iron Bank to manipulate events in Westeros. In A Dance with Dragons, we see the faceless men use Arya to gather information and uh, execute people in service of Bravos's political goals, namely ending the slave trade. She informs on a ship trafficking humans and then is ordered to kill the underwriter who sold insurance to that ship and therefore profited from slavery. Bravos does not mess around. That is the faceless men enforcing the first law of Bravos. And the ship Arya informed on? It was a Lyseni slaver carrying wildlings that were spirited from hard home. Also, Consider another popular fan theory, that Euron hired a faceless man to kill Balon Greyjoy and paid for the hit with a dragon egg that he, quote, threw into the sea. In my next Bravos video, I'll analyze these events and others from the books to show that Bravos has planetosi ambitions that will play a huge role in the outcome of A Song of Ice and Fire. But for now, here is why the Iron Bank's lucrative dragon egg trade matters for the end game of season eight and the role of the Golden Company. D&D love playing up the book's themes about behind the scenes secret plots, tying in a mystical event like the hatching of Danny's dragon eggs to an atypical fantasy element like a loan and a shadowy political plot set in motion hundreds of years earlier 
and then enacted by Varys and Illyrio would let the show come full circle in a very on-brand way. Also, this plot could be why George R. R. Martin wanted to release Fire and Blood before the finale of the show. Finally, a dramatic betrayal by the Golden Company is a visually spectacular way to illustrate that power is a trick, a shadow on the wall. Okay, plug your ears for like 10 seconds if you don't want to hear a minor production spoiler. We know that Tycho Nestoris doesn't appear in season 8 because Mark Gaddis, the actor that plays him, says so. But we don't need Tycho Nestoris to hold a knife to Cersei's throat for the Iron Bank to influence who wins the Iron Throne. In a shocking fashion, Harry Strickland can command the Golden Company to turn cloak and support John or Danny at a key strategic moment. It is a replay of Ned in the throne room in season one. But this time, it will be Cersei relying on a promise of loyalty secured by a piece of paper and someone else's money. And this time, the power players will cast shadows on the wall on a much grander scale. All right, so you might be thinking, but isn't the end of the show supposed to be about preventing the Night King from ending the world? Look, I know that the Army of the Dead is the threat that Westeros should be focused on, but Game of Thrones, and A Song of Ice and Fire for that matter, is not a story about dragons and ice zombies. The real drama of the show is political and human. And let's face it, Lena Headey is one of its strongest assets. So whatever happens with the Night King, the machinations of Cersei and everyone else who is focused on the power of the Iron Throne are going to be part of the endgame. So personally, as a card-carrying believer that the Iron Throne will either be melted, frozen, or irrelevant at the very end, I would love nothing more than to watch Cersei be deposed by a potentially centuries-old conspiracy and then have that plot fail too. Because here is George R. R. Martin's point. Power is a trick. An illusion. No matter if you're a good guy or a bad guy, or how well laid and financed your scheming is, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, as the saying goes. And if you're playing the Game of Thrones, you are going to lose, no matter who you back. That's why this season is marketed as hashtag for the throne. They are priming us for a season full of political intrigue, and they're going to deliver and then shock us with an ending that drives home how everyone's damnable obsession with the throne not only put the world in danger, but also proved to be completely futile. 